Andrew Johnson uh, from England. Uh, actually, this gentleman has given presentations and written and posted a number of articles on various websites about 9-11, about Mars, about chemtrails and anti-gravity research, uh, while challenging some of the authorities uh, to address some of the most compelling data that is available. His website is www.checktheevidence.com, and he recently attended a conference uh, in Europe uh, called the Global Breakthrough Energy Movement uh, back in November and actually attended that conference with Dr. Judy Wood. Now, uh, before I turn it over and introduce uh, Andrew Johnson to you, I want to tell you this is how I had met Andrew Johnson. Uh, I had discovered Dr. Judy's information her about her book. I actually, I think, uh, shortly before I conversed with him in a comment thread, I had discovered uh, through the, the video uh, uh, that Jesse Ventura, it was a video that I had listened to audio, Jesse Ventura talking with Alex Jones about Dr. Judy's information. And uh, Jesse Ventura since then, uh, obviously has has done a lot uh, for the world to uh, release Dr. Judy's information uh, that he believes is very, very important. Now, Andrew Johnson met me in a comment thread. I had just started learning about her information, and I was immediately starting to talk to people in comment threads. And he brought something to my attention that was so impactful and helped me kind of focus on the task at hand, and that was to learn about all of the evidence. And before I was prepared to start communicating what I had discovered, it was important for me not to muddle up the terminology. Because, ladies and gentlemen, since 9-11, since that horrifying event, and this happens with a lot of things that have, that have occurred here in the world, we have been under a PSYOP. We've been conditioned and trained to hear certain words and think certain things to take us away from uh, the real truth and the real facts and the real evidence. So Andrew actually introduced me to that term muddled, and I, in reading his comment uh, threads, very, very responsibly said, look, at you, you have to look at the evidence very, very clearly and obviously communicate that, but very, be very cautious not to step over the line of assisting the PSYOP. So you have to be very, very cautious as to how you speak of these things, and you also need to be very cognizant of the fact that you're conversing with people, in some cases, who are employed to be there to oppose everything that you're saying about 9-11 uh, evidence, such as what Dr. Judy Wood has revealed, is that the possibility uh, that directed energy weapons were used on 9-11. And we shall be opposed by that, especially free energy that is available for the entire world uh, could potentially put an oil industry out of business. They have a lot of spare cash to spend in opposing what we're about to talk about here today. So Andrew Johnson, two months ago, I think it was approximately, that uh, that we had uh, we had met in that in that comment thread, and since then I've learned so much about two things: Dr. Judy Wood's uh, evidence, as well as how to how to counter the psyop and deal with the so-called trolls that are out there on the internet. It's a very very interesting phenomena. And welcome to the Pete Santilli Show. Oh, thanks, Pete. Thanks for inviting me on, and uh, and obviously thank you very much for featuring, uh, you know, all the research so heavily in your recent uh, series of programs and so on. It's uh, very important, as you know, that uh, more people become aware and are given a chance to think about things, you know, with a clear view, mm -hmm. as you were saying there in the introduction, rather than having sort of hurdles in the way and things slightly subtly changed. And uh, it's a minefield. It really is. It is, and I, and I sense that just looking at um, at your interest in, in following some of these uh, uh, th these very important topics, I believe uh, I believe that you had that same level of curiosity that I've always had about discovering the truth, about learning the truth, and and I think you've approached it in a very sound, sane way, and you've learned a lot through that process, haven't you? Uh, very much so, yes, and I think you've, you've used the key word there, and that is curiosity, and, and if people are not curious, then they really won't, you know, sort of take those first steps into uncovering things, and then following through on that, when you, you know, in other words, if you have a, a basic level of curiosity, you're looking at why, th why there is inconsistency in things, why things, certain things don't seem to make sense, and uh, if you, if you, if you keep your you know antennae 
finely tuned and finely adjusted, you can see, you know, the, the difficulty comes where you, you're faced with a pitch which, you know, 95% of it makes sense, and then there's this remaining 5%, which which is it seems to be very important, but it, that also doesn't make sense. And um, so you then go into that 5% and try and explore it. And it's like, you know, you're talking about these, these, these trolls, and these trolls come in different flavors. There are there are people uh, that are out and out debunkers and will just, you know, attack you and uh, insult you before actually making any kind of argument. And then there are those trolls who will befriend you, they will buddy up to you, they will say nice things about you, and then they'll take you 95% of the way with your discussion, and then that remaining 5%, when you start to discuss that, mm -hmm. they will attack you and uh, you know say that you're an idiot which is essentially what what happened to me in my involvement with these with one of the 9/11 uh, research groups which formed in 2005 2006 mm -hmm. uh, you know so that, so that was my experience and it all seemed perfectly fine and everyone seemed to be you know willing to look at the evidence but then when this particular evidence which came up for discussion which you know it was, it was perfectly consistent perfectly uh, uh, well documented uh, but they didn't want to discuss that evidence they didn't want to talk about it and when you try to talk about it they just skipped over it or if you really hammered home the point they'd change the subject or after that they'd insult you um, so uh, these things these were the, some of the things that weren't making sense to me at the time that I first came across uh, what Dr. Judy Wood had started to um, mm -hmm. you know research and post on the internet for the first time now I, I want to I want to really delve into this because you have studied it and I have studied it and I, I think you've seen me uh, I call it getting in there and scrapping with the trolls to really understand and learn how to differentiate uh, somebody uh, somebody with a negative attitude that opposes a theory uh, and then wants to get in there and counter it or here's the next thing that people do not realize is happening and that is what I'm calling it's like a black ops on the internet where we have a secret presence of either government sponsored or corporate sponsored individuals that get in there to meld themselves in with society with internet society and into mold and shape the threads, the comment threads that you're reading, because mm. to the honest observer that gets into a comment thread on any particular topic, if they take a glance at the, at the general topic of conversation, if that message is controlled by these operatives, they've helped sway people away from the true evidence. And they're very, very skilled at this. Is this not a not only a concerted effort, but a grand conspiracy taking place on the Internet right now? Well, I think it's, it's the, I think it's a mixture of things, really, and sometimes it's difficult to categorise the uh, you know certain posters into one or two of those uh, areas because there is definitely uh, the 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 you know you get the leaders and the followers basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it, you know, I've written a lot about in my book, for example, just to give a couple of examples for people to go and research into if they wish. Mm -hmm. um, I've written quite a lot about Jim Fetzer, for example, because I interacted with him personally. I never met him. Well, actually, I did meet him personally in London in uh, 2010, which is a, a strange uh, sort of scenario for me to be in at the time. But I corresponded with him a lot by email, and he invited me to join this scholars group. And so I was able to essentially determine for myself that this guy was acting as a leader to trying to lead other groups of people uh, off the path where the evidence was leading to mm -hmm. and I, I can prove that I think and if, if somebody was to come to me and say well look uh, we've now got uh, the evidence that we have a group of people that are covering up the biggest crime of the you know millennium and we want to prosecute them and we think Jim Fetcher is one of those people would you be willing to testify in court against this person I would say yes because I have the evidence of my personal interactions with them which I've documented mm -hmm. to prove that this guy is is helping to cover up what really happened on 9-11 mm -hmm. he's helping to pervert the course of justice as we we call it here mm -hmm. which is itself a crime so you get at the one end of the scale you get people like him now 
Is he being paid to do what he's doing? Is he being given money? Uh, has he got a gun to his head? In other words, if he doesn't do this, you know, something awful will happen to him or his family, or, you know, they'll take his house away from him or something. I, I don't have the answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from his actions, you can see what he's up to. So he's at one end of the scale. Then you'll get, at the other end of the scale, anonymous posters on the internet who will make completely false statements such as that the towers did not turn to dust, they collapsed and burned down. Mm -hmm. And we can see from the evidence that that is a false statement. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those people, you know, they're anonymous, you have no idea where they've come from, mm -hmm. they use ridiculous sounding handles, um, and so you have no, you know, you have no proof who they are, you have no proof of what their agenda is, um, and is is people's opinion swayed by those things? Well, I think ultimately it is, because when you do a Google search and you get all this trash coming up about a particular person, you know, I mean, something that we've experienced is that people will read the trash and they don't have time to sort through the trash mm -hmm. to to actually find the the real evidence. So, you know, if you Google my name or Dr. Judy Wood's name or, you know, a certain combination of keywords and it comes up with trash, you're just going to end up with reams of websites to work through before you get the reference to say my book or Dr. Judy Wood's book mm -hmm. and then you, you know, only a few people will go off and actually buy that book and then go and read it, you know, so um, that's that's the way that it works. I call it signal to noise ratio. There you go. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you can generate a lot of noise and, and make a sort of, a few statements which are true, mixed in with a lot that aren't, then for, for people that haven't studied this for I mean, I've been studying this for uh, coming up for ten years now. Mm -hmm. For people that have not invested that amount of time in it, they've they've got very little chance of uh, of actually finding out uh, what's going on. So, um, in terms of the posters, yes, I'd say we have people who are who are actually guiding things um, on the internet, they're directing certain forum discussions um, and then we've got other websites such as uh, Veterans Today which are posting certain articles by people like Jeff Prager um, who I corresponded with um, and I wrote an article about Jeff Prager's correspondence with me mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know this guy comes across as being very polite, very nice and he, he's a magazine publisher and so on and yet he claims um, that nuclear devices w were used to destroy the World Trade Center. Right. Um, and when I challenge him on this, um, he, he later writes back an email to me and uh, says that I'm, a, I'm an idiot, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and a twit. Right. Um, uh, and those were the words that he used. <laughs> yeah. But w whether I'm an idiot or a twit is, is really immaterial to the properties of uh, nuclear devices causing explosions because everyone knows that, the, the, you know, such things are very hot. They create a lot of heat. They create a lot of light. Mm -hmm. but, but to listen to this guy, he sounds sincere. He believes his own story. You know, mm -hmm. he believes what he's saying. Right. And you, and you, and you listen to some of these people, and, and that, that's how they get away with it. This Dmitry Karlazov is another character who's convinced a lot of people that he's telling the truth, mm -hmm. and he sounds sincere. Right. So, so how is he doing this? How is he sounding sincere? Is is he just a very good actor, um, or is he under some form of other influence, which we don't, you know, we don't fully fully accept or understand uh, in our everyday sort of uh, experience? Um, you know, you, you know, mentioned this, veterans this veterans, veterans today, and I, I hope you don't mind me. Uh, I do want to go on the record here, officially, formally, and publicly. Um, that uh, that I've been able to myself clearly establish those individuals right now in alternative media uh, who want to cover all of the evidence, for instance, the evidence that's contained in Dr. Judy Wood's investigation that was filed with the federal court system, those that are willing to bring that information forward are, are, are typically the ones that are not compromised or tainted. But those that are opposing that are either being fed information from the top to deter them and detract them, and they need to discover the truth. But veterans today, there's a gentleman named Gordon Duff. He is a very well-known person over there uh, in, I would consider it, uh, alternative media. Uh, but Gordon Duff, uh, I have uh, uh, tried to get on the show, 
and I'm not going to talk about the details as to why he did not come on the show uh, about a week or two ago. But I'm going to encourage Gordon Duff, somebody like him who has had high-level contacts in the government and so on and so forth, and a lot of people talking in his ear. Now, whether or not this Jim Fetzer has been fed the wrong information, uh, eventually they, have, they, they, they come to believe the stuff that they've been told. And I'm hoping that Gordon Duff uh, comes on my show and reveals the fact that he just doesn't know enough about Dr. Judy Wood's uh, evidence uh, to 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 get out there and to counter it. A lot of that stuff has happened in alternative media outlets, and I think that people have been swayed by individuals at the top. Don't you agree? Well, there's a lot of swaying going on. I think that's the way a lot of it works. And, uh, you know, uh, you are who you associate with, I suppose, is a, uh, an expression that a friend of mine used. And I think that right. there's a lot of truth in that. Okay. Um, no, I it, mean, with Gordon Gordon Duff, I've, I've not, uh, you know, not personally interacted with Gordon Duff myself. Mm -hmm. But I have seen recent postings of him uh, stating Opposing. publicly yeah. Yeah. that uh, what he's written for veterans today. Andrew, stay, it, Andrew never, stay right there. We have five seconds here. We're going to go to a break and come back, and let's talk about who these possible influencers are at the top when we come back. Not to uh, burn bridges, per se, okay? I, I want to uh, formally, uh, and I'm going to say this publicly, that I want to invite uh, the honorable, uh, I say honorable, in, in journalistic uh, circles, uh, Gordon Duff, to have a discussion with me about the fact that he may be skipping over some of the most important evidence uh, of, of our of our lives, uh, and that is the evidence contained in the book, uh, Where Did the Towers Go? So I want to invite Gordon Duff to the show and to clearly establish uh, whose side he's on. And if he opposes disclosing this evidence, then we know exactly what side anyone is on. And that could be applied uh, to just about anybody at the top of the food chain. Now, who these people at the top of the food chain are has been investigated and filtered through very diligently, very methodically, uh, very fairly, I believe. I think that you're going to, before the end of the show, realize that Andrew Johnson, for his own uh, well-being and education, has tried to figure out who these individuals are. So, Andrew, who do you think these key players are, these key influencers at the top of, let's say, the scientific community, uh, like a Stephen Jones, a Jim Fetzer, can you please tell us what you've been able to, to find up to this point as to who's who and what they're doing and whether or not their intentions are good or bad, uh, what, what side they're on? Well, I think, uh, you know, again, it comes down to them, as you were saying, discussing particular sorts of evidence and the way that they discuss it in terms of, uh, you know, particularly what Dr. Judy Wood has put together, obviously, because that's the main central thing of what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, I've written a lot about Jim Fetzer, as I said, and that's in my book, 9-11, Finding the Truth, which you can download free mm -hmm. from checktheevidence.com. There is also a Kindle version and an iPad version, which are free depending on where you get them and there's also a, an mp3 audio book version which is also free so mm -hmm. I've tried to make this information as widely available as I can mm -hmm. with the resources that I've got um, so you know the best thing for people to do uh, for following this is to, is to download that and read as much as they can so that they've got chance to see whether I'm just you know talking nonsense or whether you know when I, when I was saying I would take this to court whether that's actually a justifiable statement which I would say that it is um, so yes uh, Jim Fetzer is one he you know just a very brief summary with him he invited me and Stephen E. Jones invited me to join the scholars for 9-11 truth group which formed at the beginning of uh, well the end of 2005 uh, stroke the beginning of 2006 and um, I, I, I became sort of quite good friends with them in, in terms of you know I thought we all shared the same goal of exposing the truth about 9-11 but then when I started to realize that what Dr. Wood had been putting on the table was being covered up and marginalized and I started to say you know hang on a minute what about this this research here um, they became less and less kind of friendly, I suppose you'd say. Mm. Uh, and Jim Fetzer ended up insulting me, calling me childish, um, saying that I was a poor student of logic. And this was about six months after he'd invited me personally to mm. join the steering committee of the 9-11 Scholars Group. Mm. Now, that should give you a clue as to how some of these people operate, because what he was trying to do initially was uh, keep me 
keep tabs on me. He'd, he'd spot, they'd spotted me posting uh, arguments based on physics around the internet. That's why they invited me into the scholars group. He then thought he'd uh, invite me onto this steering committee to make me feel important, to make me feel I could contribute something positive to the group. Mm -hmm. When in actuality, nothing, that's, the steering committee never did anything. It wasn't, there was nothing to do, basically. Hmm. Uh, and so it was just, just done as a way, I think, of, of making me feel important. But I'm not one of those people that wants to feel important. I don't want, I don't want that. I just want to know what's what, basically, and make sure that I'm uh, passing that information on to all the people mm -hmm. accurately. Um, and the big clue really came when Dr. Wood established the link to the Hutchinson effect, because th 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 that immediate time when that research was being developed, I suppose, or put out into the public domain, that's when he started to attack me the, the, he the, the most heavily. Um, and, th th and also when uh, we started to talk about the connection of Stephen E. Jones, mm -hmm. who was involved in cold fusion research um, in, the, in the late 80s, and he's mentioned a hundred times in Dr. Eugene Mallow's book, Fire from Ice. When we started to talk about that, Jim Fess wasn't really that bothered about talking about that. And, of course, Stephen E. Jones wasn't particularly either. Um, and that really, to me, was a very, very big indicator that the energy issue was extremely important in, in what happened on 9-11. On um, so, so Stephen E. Jones, uh, his job in the 9-11 research community was essentially to try and herd people together in the scholars group was one venue to attack the people that were presenting the most compelling evidence for something very important and that in this case was primarily Dr. Wood. Um, Jones didn't really attack me, I mean I, I'm, I haven't really got any scientific credentials of any particular note mm -hmm. so I, I was of no, no threat to them um, but, he, but he, did, he did try and sort of uh, say that I I was I was uh, acting to um, you know not allow scientific fairness or something. I can't remember the exact words he used in this message. Mm. But he didn't correspond with me very much. He didn't try and he never he never uh, contradicted anything that I said about him. Mm -hmm. um, and neither is Jim Fetzer for that matter. He's never denied anything. I've, I put put, out, put on my website that he singled himself out as somebody who's willing to cover up the crime of 9/11, and he's, he's never argued with that one either so um, you know uh, if he wants to sue me for libel or whatever then uh, he hasn't he hasn't done so mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. neither has anyone else for that matter uh, um, there was another another person who did try and uh, uh, sue me for libel and that was Alfred Weber Alfred Weber runs a website called um, uh, Peace in Space. He runs a website called exopolitics.com uh, and I became familiar with him in my study of the, study of the UFO field. He was uh, very interesting in that he interviewed Dr. Judy Wood and John Hutchison together. He's actually one of the few people to do that. He personally interviewed Dr. Judy Wood and John Hutchison together at his house in February 2008. He got So he got the evidence from the horses' mouths and he agreed with them. At that time, I've got recording of that and he actually said yes this is this is huge this is enormous this is big we can see the energy connection quite clearly now thanks to your research when are you going to publish a scientific paper um, six months later he has his own radio show and he gets on somebody called Lorraine Murray who claims to have been a geoscientist at Lawrence Livermore Uni Univers um, Lawrence Livermore Laboratories and he says to her at the start of this interview um, so why did you think uh, Hart destroyed the World Trade Center? And she says, um, well, actually, it was uh, Dr. Judy Wood's research that made me think that. And then Alfred Weber says, now, without mentioning Dr. Judy Wood, tell me why you think Harp destroyed the World Trade Center. So if that's not a muddle up and a cover up right there, wow. uh, I, I don't know what is. Mm. He was making it plain, you know, and I've got audio clips of them saying that so people can actually hear that recording rather than me just, you know, sort of making that up. Yes, sir. Um, no. So hey. Alfred Weber is another one. Um, He's he involved with the cover up. Now, uh, Andrew, before we go to before we go to our break, we have a caller on the line. Would you mind if I if I took a caller real quick? Uh, not at all. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Stephen uh, 
uh, on the line. You're live on the Pete Santilli Show. Uh, we have just a couple minutes here. Do you have a question for Andrew Johnson? Yeah, I'm just I'm curious. Do you think maybe Spencer is just jealous of the publicity that's something that competes with some of his sort of, uh, I guess, take on things? Just if he's more concerned with that, he seems like he's almost more of that than he is a COINTEL pro agent. I, I, I mean, I really want to, you know, I, I really think that Dr. Wood is on to the, the real thing, but I think that it's not solidified, and I think all these other countering sort of arguments still need to go on until we get to the truth. But attacking all these guys personally, it's like, who even cares? Who even cares about what sets their thing? Well, it, it, it's, in, it's important, Stephen, and I'm going to let Andrew address this because we are going to cover this right after this break. But go ahead, Andrew. I'll let you answer that. Right. Right. One of the strategies is that if somebody attacks us, if somebody attacks me and calls me whatever, which is documented in my book, which has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, then we have to respond. Now, to, it can have, this is one of the strategies of the psychological operation. As soon as you attack somebody, they have they can either just ignore it or respond. Now, if I, I ignore it, then it can be taken that whatever is said about me is actually true and I can't respond to it. However, if I respond, then it's assumed that I'm infighting. So, right. uh, you, you know, you, you, it's, it's sort of a, a no-win situation once a person who's made an right. attack makes the attack. I agree. So, I agree. so going I back to your that, question, I, think that you can I haven't answered answer your question about FETSA yet. Sure. If, uh, is it to do with jealousy? Well, I've considered all those things, and the only way you'll know that I've considered all those things is if you read the articles that I've written, which you can download. Uh, you can either view the individual articles on my website, and you can see the emails from Jim FETSA, or you can read the whole book. So, well, is, it jealousy? is it jealousy? Is it jealousy? Um, I would say, no, it goes way beyond jealousy, but, you know, you'd have to well, read I agree. the articles to find the out. Way he got the, I think he's kind of like a, uh, a snob when it comes to sort of edu his education and everything. And when when Judy was teaming up with, uh, what's the guy's name, the Canadian guy that you guys And, and by, the way, it's, by the way, it's Dr. Judy Wood. Mm hmm I'm sorry. I think she's a genius. I, yes, Dr. Yeah. Judy Wood. And I, but, but when she was teaming up with the Canadian guy who doesn't have a real formal education, that's where the whole cluster divide started to occur. And then he just he seems like an insecure child for the most part when he's criticizing yep. Judy. He agrees with her, Dr. Judy Wood. But then at the same time, he always takes a shot at her not closing the loop. But that's all he's got. And I and I listen to Fester, but I know he's limited in that scope. Stephen? I ignore all his Stephen, have we covered everything? We're going to go to a break here. I didn't want to interrupt you. Are we, are we okay? Did you get all your questions out for uh, Mr. Johnson? I, I did. I'm sorry. I, it's always tough to talk to you, Pete. I hope I don't over-talk you because you're such a polite guy. But uh, anyway, great show. It. And I just want to hear more about Dr. G with Sirius and less about Absolutely. The, the end fighting Absolutely. and all that crap. Nobody cares about yes. it. Yes. Actually, we do care about the end fighting. This is important. When a psychological operation is perpetrated upon the American public to shape their minds, we want to find out who is talking into their ears. It's really important. We come back. We're going to talk about how Alex Jones is so important in this regard. It's important that we bring him up. We'll be right back. We were just talking uh, through uh, through the break. I mean, if if, and I thought it was important for Stephen to to get out. Uh, and I think he said this before on our show. Why is it you know why is it important to bring up these people? Let's just talk about the evidence. Well, uh, it, it, I would say that it is the equivalent. Learning who these people are are just as marred, uh, just a, as big a part of the evidentiary package. Okay, because the cover up that has taken place before, during, and after 9-11 has been the most damaging thing to our society because if they're going to herd, they're going to attack, they're going to credentialize, establish credibility with their scientific education and all those things, and then out there blurting to distract us away from the evidence, uh, don't you think, uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, that that is probably the biggest thing we need to understand as to why this evidence has been sitting here for so many years and and, right. and we're so surprised by it, you know, when we discovered after 10 years, oh, yeah. like... Absolutely, and it's so, yeah, I mean, you know, the call, call of Steve made a point about uh, not talking about the infighting and stuff. Well, yeah, but I don't like talking about that sort of thing, but it's necessary to to understand how the cover-up works, mm -hmm. and that's what I've tried to do. Dr. Wood reverse-engineered what happened to the World Trade Center, and I think if you read 9-11, Finding the Truth... 
I've tried to reverse engineer the cover-up, and we were talking a bit of, in particular about the actions of Jim Fetzer and the way that he's able to manipulate people. Now, for example, one of those techniques of manipulation was uh, brought up, I think, in the chat room by somebody, and that was the Vancouver hearings which happened in the summer. And uh, he actually invited uh, Dr. Wood to go and to those conferences, but because he'd previously threatened her and said that um, if she didn't back off her relations with John Hutchison, uh, there, there was a chance... Uh, well, sorry, if she backed off her rep rep uh, relations with John Hutchison, there was a chance that her reputation could be salvaged. That's what Jim Fetzer wrote to Dr. Wood in an email in 2008, and I've got that in my book if people want to actually read the exact words. Mm. And it's on my website. Mm -hmm. So when somebody is using language like that, that essentially is a threat. Mm -hmm. So why would you want to go and speak at somebody's conference who is threatening you? So, and this is what people don't understand because they don't have the available evidence such as that in the email and more which we couldn't really discuss easily in an open forum. Mm -hmm. But that is one that we can discuss and has been discussed by myself on several occasions. So why would this fellow organize a conference in Vancouver, invite her, then she does reply because she's been threatened previously by this chap and he's done nothing to um, sort of you know repair that if it, that situation he then invites somebody else who's not a scientist to present Dr. Judy Wood's research rather than for example showing the DVD which I produced in 2011 with the, all the up-to-date research he could have shown that at the conference free of charge and no expense but instead he decides he would invite somebody else by the name of Claire Kuhn to, uh, to present this evidence and do the best job she do, do, could do, which inv actually, if you go and look at the best job she could do, introduces nuclear devices, which were not in Dr. Wood's presentation. It introduces a lot of spelling mistakes, which were not in Dr. Wood's presentation. It introduces tiny thumbnail images, which were uh, very blurred and not in Dr. Wood's presentation. So why would somebody like Jim Fetzer want to sanction a person and doing that at a conference in Vancouver, which is outside of the United States of America, by the way, flying up all those people from the United States to Canada, why exactly would he want to do that? Mm -hmm. Is that uh, jealousy? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think that's going some way beyond jealousy. Yeah. And if people want to find out the details, I suggest um, they read the article about what those Vancouver hearings were for. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest it was to encourage debate and actually reduce the level of certainty. In other words, there is no need to debate what happened to the World Trade Center anymore because it is already known what happened to it. It's a bit like debating, um, you know, whether the, the buildings are there or not. Not. We could debate whether the World Trade Center is there or not, but it would be a pointless debate because we know that they're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and this is another of the, the way that the psychological operations works, that if you encourage debate about something, you then implicitly assume that the truth is not known. And that's another of the tactics that Jim Fetzer has continued to use um, over the last t t three or four years. And there are many people who are willing to help him with this. Was it harp? Was it fluoride? Was it this? Was it that? Was it mini nukes? Well, we're not really sure if nanothermite exists in this form, so it might have been a secret military version of nanothermite. You know, all of this, all of this stuff, it's all encouraging debate and discouraging the fact that we know what happened to the World Trade Center. We know that it was destroyed with an energy weapon. We know that that energy weapon has some similarity to the uh, Hutchinson effect in terms of the effects that it creates. We don't know if it's exactly the same thing. We know that Science Applications International Corporation for example was involved in helping to write the NIST World Trade Center reports. We know that they were in charge of ground zero security. We know that Science Applications International Corporation do research into directed energy weapons because that information is posted on their website. Mm -hmm. The same can be said of Applied Research Associates. So if 
if people want to know about 9-11, I think they need to be really focusing their attention on these companies and writing to them and asking them uh, the tough questions about why they were willing to participate in a science fraud in relation to the technical reports of the, of the destruction of the World Trade Center. Um, you know, I think that would be a, a, good, a good thing for people in your country to do, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I want you to speak to also, um, the, the, I, I believe that this is a very, very important thing, that the people at the top of, uh, I call it the food chain of information that are dictating and controlling this message, because uh, it, it's almost a, a scientific, when you say that you reversed engineered the cover-up, I mean, you've also looked at the fact that they've used the credentials, the education, the credibility right. of all these people that are propagating falsities. Talk about that credentialization, because a lot of people follow and say, well, so-and-so has this degree, and he's the most renowned scientific researcher in the right. area of, you know, s small nukes. Uh, absolutely, and in fact, you know, find there's, there's actually a, a relatively small number of, of people with, with PhD degrees who are looking at the evidence at uh, this sort of level. Uh, we could really, you know, certainly uh, Jim Fetzer, for example, he, though he has a PhD, it's not in science, it's in the philosophy of science, so he's not actually a scientist. Stephen E. Jones does have a PhD, but we know that he was associated with the cold fusion mm -hmm. cover-up, mm -hmm. uh, and you can read about that in uh, Dr. Mallow's book. Um, there are very few other science PhDs that are involved in this. There's another PhD that people sometimes bring up, and that's Dr. Greg Jen Jack Jenkins of the University of Maryland. He was last heard of in 2007. Uh, I think he's published one or two papers, possibly uh, mid to late 2007, in this website, which is called the Journal of 9-11 Studies, which was set up by Stephen E. Jones. And isn't it peculiar that the Journal of 9-11 Studies, if you spell that out hmm. uh, is the word Jones hmm. um, which is rather odd is. Um, so uh, so there's not that many well qualified scientists actually putting stuff out there about 9-11 Dr. Judy Wood is, is the most highly qualified scientist uh, who's actually done this forensic study I don't think there's anybody else that comes close frankly uh, but I, yes, the credentialism was used on me. I mean, you can read about that in, in what Fetz has tried to uh, uh, sort of say to me. He, he tried to sort of pull the credentialism uh, card on me. Uh, but, you know, I, I didn't really try and play a card in return because I don't, I don't have one. I don't have the scientific credentials, as I've said before. Right. Um, and, of course... John Hutchison, for example, doesn't have any. He doesn't have any high-level qualifications. He doesn't have a university degree. He doesn't have a college education, and yet he has got letters from the Canadian government, which state that reports about his own research have been classified top secret. For example, John Hutchison has 500 pounds of metal samples. One of the people who helped carry some of those metal samples from the car to the lecture theatre in Seattle in May 2008. He actually then became convinced by Jim Fetzer that those samples were all fake, even though he'd physically handled them himself. Huh. He, he became convinced that those samples were fake. Hmm. That's how strong the psychological operation is, that right. people who've actually held physical evidence can become convinced later because somebody can, you know, perform a psychological operation on them that what they previously understood to be uh, true... Uh, you know, real physical evidence is no longer relevant right. or no longer valid. Can, can I expound yeah. upon upon this? And I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, and, and, and you have to, and, and I'm balancing this out, me as the curious individual, because I believe that it's very, very important um, that, that um, you know, the credentials, I mean, like, for instance, Dr. Judy Wood's uh, credentials to, to talk about interferometry, right? Obviously, she's an expert in that area. But it's important to know that the people that are presenting this evidence to you are qualified to do so, to understand it and to be able to translate it into a language we can understand. So I'm not taking away from that. But let me let me reverse engineer this thing for the, the listeners to why this has been used against us. Because if, for instance, tritium is discovered in the dust, they thereby go out and find a nuclear expert that can give a, every single justification for tritium being contained in, in, the, in that dust, in that evidence. And they sway the minds of the people 
in, with their justification for why tritium is there to include everything but the possibility of cold fusion or low energy nuclear reaction. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the other thing that, that you made me think of there, Pete, is the timing. Mm-hmm. Now, we, you know, just to give you an example of the way that these psyops work, as, as you mentioned earlier in the, in the broadcast, um, we went to this Global Breakthrough Energy Movement conference, uh, and present at that conference was another fairly well-known speaker who's built up a rep- bit of a reputation for himself, Sterling Allen. And uh, I can tell you that he became quite agitated when the tritium was being discussed in Dr. Wood's uh, presentation. And then soon after that, Stephen E. Jones published a new uh, letter or something. I don't know if it was a, a letter or a... He said he'd done a new experiment relating to Pons and Fleischmann's cold fusion research in the 80s, which Sterling Allen then proceeded to quote. It seemed very much to me as if the exposure of this tritium evidence at the conference had rattled a few cages because the, the Stephen E. Jones felt it necessary to come out of retirement to supposedly before an experiment related to cold fusion, which he hasn't done, I think, for probably at least 10 years. So when you get these these uh, things being made public and then other groups or other researchers posting new things specifically to try and debunk those observations, such as the ones you were referring to about the tritium, right. That, to me, is highly suggestive uh, that those uh, bits of information are vitally important to actually confirming that this is indeed an energy phenomenon that we're looking at in terms of what happened to the World Trade Center. That's right. And indeed, it's related to cold fusion or low energy nuclear reaction, re- re- nuclear reactions, and that people need to be distracted away from that and made to doubt that right. so that it's not discussed. T- t- so I think that that's another aspect of the way that these psychological operations are working, the mm-hmm. timing of them. Right. Now, how we as the layperson, I'm going to consider myself a layperson, I'm waking up to all this. I, I'm not a, a scientist uh, who is credentialed, but I will say this, I can hold a nuclear scientist who comes forward to justify the presence of tritium I will hold that person accountable to their credentials if they're excluding the possibility that tritium is a byproduct of cold fusion. I will actually hold their credentials against them if they choose. And this is where the layperson can say, okay, what side of the agenda is this guy on? He is a credentialed nuclear scientist. Why is he not mentioning cold fusion or the possibility of that? What is he trying to conceal? Well, I think it becomes difficult in those areas because mm-hmm. we as lay people, you know, we have to take their word for it. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's the way that the credentialisms works at times. You know, they, right. they'll make a statement and you assume that they're telling the truth right. because of their credentials. When in actuality, they may be telling the best you know, version of the story as they know it and they've been taught it, mm-hmm. but then you have to consider the underlying possibility that the, what, what they've been taught is incorrect. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that incorrect knowledge has been in place for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Mm-hmm. And all that they studied and presented has been based on that incomplete or incorrect knowledge. Mm-hmm. And then when somebody like me comes along and says, ah, oh, but have you considered the Hutchinson effect? They'll say, the Hutchinson effect, what's that? I'll mm-hmm. go and Google it, mm-hmm. and then they'll find all these articles debunking John Hutchinson and saying that he makes fake upside down videos. And they'll come to you back to you as a credential scientist and say, Ah, oh, but these videos that John Hutchinson has produced are all fake, and there is no scientific evidence to show that what he's you know, been doing is mm-hmm. real. Right. Uh, and because you, you, you know, because it's very, very difficult to reproduce his experimental setup. Um, then you know you, you, it's hard to take that back into the for them to take that back into the laboratory, right. and you know go forward from there. And so you get this is why we're in this difficult area with this particular phenomenon. Oh yes, mm-hmm. you know that 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 it's been reproduced um, many times by John. He can tell other people how to do it, but because they don't believe it, because their science doesn't explain it, they're not willing to re- they're not willing to try to reproduce it because if they do, it means that a lot of their textbooks and so so on are going to have to go in the bin, you know, because uh, or in the trash, as you would say. So uh, mm-hmm. you know, so so that's one of the problems as well. We're looking at uh, some knowledge which is so fundamental and so powerful and so world changing. 
changing that people have a very very hard time accepting that it's not been discovered right. before very very complex um thoughts but it needs to be recognized everyone can understand that credentialism is so complex that it could be right. used it could be used against us for instance you know towards me like pete santilli you're not qualified to talk about dr judy's uh, evidence because you're a non-scientist that could be used as a means to hurt attack distract right now i'm going to play a brief right. audio clip here um I, we have just a couple minutes here i may have to bring it okay. but uh, let me let me bring let me bring this up here real quick here's up uh, mr fetzer uh quizzing uh, John Hutchinson. Okay. Now, Judy, I've been informed that we have John Hutchinson on the line. So, John, I want to welcome you to the Dynamic Duo. Hello. John, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your background, your, your uh, education, especially your training in, in science and technical subjects? Well, my education is I flunked my coloring book and blocks. <laughs> I'm self-taught, and I've been involved in many applications in engineering and research, and one of them happened to be into Nikola Tesla, which... We come back. We're going to finish that recording. This is important. Don't you dare go away. Credentialism. Bet you never heard of that term before. So here publicly, I'm going to declare myself a um, an advocate of truth by revealing the fact that what took place on 9-11, I believe that they want to conceal it from us because they don't want us to know that energy is available to us freely. That the energy that was used is available to all of us if it's used for good. But it was used for evil, and that's why they want to keep it away from us. So I want to publicly declare uh, myself in the face of the oil industry, someone who wants to out them and expose them for what they are. And I don't, guess what? I don't have the credentials to do so. I have a mind. It's a free one. I have a heart. It's a big one, and it's on the side of all of the people that have been victimized. Okay, now let's go back to uh, the victimization uh, perpetrated by Mr. Fetzer on John Hutchison. Okay, let's listen to this audio recording. Well, my education is I flunked my coloring book and blocks. <laughs> I'm self-taught, and I've been involved in many applications in engineering and research, and one of them happened to be into Nikola Tesla, which I was able to replicate a lot of ex his experiments. And pushing it beyond the envelope there, we were managed to cause levitation of objects and also the destruction of objects, as it's called. And did, did everyone hear that? I, I, I'm pausing here. I want you to pay attention to what he just said. A man with no credentials reproduced levitation. He actually bent a piece of solid copper 2.5 inches in diameter, okay? Then this is a man who has the credentials of us beating potatoes people. And he had gained interest into the U.S. Uh, military back in 1983, which they did a lot of experiments and tests with it. So, so you grew up in Canada? Uh, yes, I did. Where, where about? Oh, I'm in New Westminster, British Columbia. I grew up in North Vancouver, by the way. In North Vancouver? Yeah, I was away in Europe for a while. I just landed in, <coughs> in New Westminster. I presume you went to, to school there, or high school, for example? Mm, well, I had a... Um, excuse me. I had a private tutor, and we were mostly in the chemi I was into chemistry quite a bit, and I was in the chemical lab, also gunsmithing and machine tool work. But a little later on, I got into the the Tesla stuff, which is kind of intriguing. But you never you never matri matriculated to a university. You, you didn't actually earn. You don't have university degrees. You don't have a an academic background or a scientific background other than what you learned in the process of your tutoring and your self learning. That's right. Yes. Thank God for that. Because if I went the normal route and all that stuff, then I'd be programmed to not uh, think outside of the box. <laughs> Excuse me, I've been under the weather all week with a nasty case of the stomach flu. How, how, have, you, how have you made your living, John? Well, I made my living through uh, various, well, defense contractors, giving demonstrations for them, as well as, that's Canadian, mm -hmm. as well as American, and mm -hmm. Germany, and uh, of late, I've been doing a lot of um, television shows, and there's really high demand for that, so they, they pay large amounts of money for coming here to film. And, 
and and before you got into the the effects and so forth, your discoveries of how how were you you know making ends meet? Oh, way back past 1970. Say anytime. Fill me in. Wow, that's uh, back in 1970. Prior to that, I was involved in a major court case against the Canadian government on gun control issues, and prior to that, it's just um, on welfare, getting odd jobs, that kind of thing. So it was a lot of fun. Not so long time ago. It seems like that. <laughs> you and Judy are, are kind of striking contrast cases because, of course, Judy has multiple degrees in academic background, 60 peer-reviewed articles, and and your background is completely the opposite. Yeah, kind of wild and woolly there, but uh, it's been an interesting adventure. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I get along fine with the scientists and that. We work together on different projects and Go ahead, Judy. Yeah, I've noticed something different uh, with John than the typical student. Uh, John thinks. The student's program. <laughs> well, they check the answer to the back of the book, and that, that's, <coughs> you know. So very uh, interesting uh, interchange there. But I believe right. uh, I believe Mr. Mr. Hutchison represented himself uh, honestly. I mean, he he talked about um, and, and and you know he did so. He was recently featured uh, in Jesse Ventura's um, uh, episode. Uh, and, and if you want to go back and see that, it's actually on the internet. You can actually download it. Uh, but you can see uh, what Mr. Hutchison has has been working on. Now the the, the key elements are uh, on the other side of the coin. Uh, we have a Dr. Judy Wood who is credentialed. He's admitted that. he, She has the education. She has the credibility to bring these issues forward. So it is important. But you'll notice part of the psychological operation is to, you know, for him to call her Judy and, and to minimize her and to decredentialize her just by referring her to Judy and take away her, her doctor status, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's a whole number of tricks like that which right. we, we've noticed uh, Very over, subtle. over the years, really. Mm hmm you know, Very, so, so I mean, yeah, I mean, if you look at those questions to John Hutchinson, it sort of went way beyond uh, what you would normally ask a guest, you know, asking them to go back, oh, do you have a university ed education? You know, why ask that question? Mm -hmm. Why not ask there? John, for example, said, oh, I, d I did some work for the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the, my automatic was, oh, well, what did you do? What, what, you know, which, which, was it Air Force? Was it Army? Was it Navy? You know, where did you work? What sort of projects were you involved with? You know, those are the questions that I would ask. Mm -hmm. You know, not oh, oh. So that means you haven't got an education, then. You know, right. So, 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 and, and as you say, John had no qualms about answering any of the questions. He was perfectly candid and uh, you right. know quite jovial about it. Well, he was, I think he was quite pleased with himself. You know, he he realised that he'd been able to do all these things and was justifiably proud of that. Right. So he didn't try and cover anything up. He had no need to because he was telling the truth. Could could you touch on this? Okay, and and a lot of people are coming awake to, to these facts that uh, Mr. Hutchison has been able to replicate a lot of the things that took place on 9-11 that's in the evidence. Do, are, are you aware of those things? Could you list those for the for the audience? Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, you know, if you look at the uh, pages on Dr. Wood's website, basically, John has reproduced levitation. We saw levitation of witnesses uh, on 9-11 and uh, things like we had upside down uh, police cars and so on, mm -hmm. fire trucks. Right. Uh, we've had the, the bent metal, and as you mentioned there, John has got a number of samples where the metal has become either bent into a horseshoe shape, such as a copper bar, and we've seen bars which are held by WJE for NIST have the same deformation pattern with no wrinkles and no burn marks. Um, we have peeling effects within the metal, like it's delaminated. Uh, some of the samples that John Hudson have ex exhibited this, and uh, they've the, the samples that uh, on some of the so-called toasted cars have also got delaminated sections. Um, then we've had these weird fires uh, that John has seen in a, few, a number of his experiments. Fires appearing to you know, things appearing to combust, um, and then uh, we've we've 
we've also seen the cars exploding near the World Trade Center, or say exploding not in the sense of a bomb going off, but mm-hmm. exploding into flame. Uh, we had uh, the Bankers Trust building, which was had res- seemed to have residual effects in it because they repaired the Bankers Trust building, and then in, I think in 2006, they began to take it down piece by piece, saying it had a mold infection, and if you look at the effects there, it appears to be a high level of rust on some of the beams, and there were some very strange uh, fire events in the Bankers Trust building as well during the deconstruction, and three firefighters were killed. I, forget, I think that was 2006 as well or 2007 Um, so some very strange effects there Um, and uh, also low energy Um, no heat if John puts his hand into his experiments uh, and picks out the bent metal sample it's cold Mm-hmm. Um, and also we saw very little evidence of heat at the World Trade Center, which is another thing that they've tried to cover up and muddle up, very much so. And that's why primarily these alternative explanations, which don't explain the evidence, involve heat of some kind, nanothermite, nuclear devices, and their variants are all hot phenomena. Yes. Now, the, the key element, and tell me if you agree or disagree with this, is that... Um, uh, Mr. Hutchison has been able to replicate things, even on a smaller scale, with respect to levitation. There was a scientist named uh, George uh, Piggott, uh, who was uh, in Where Did the Towers Go?, uh, who essentially, um, as a scientist, way back when, I, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, but he, uh, Mr. Hutchison, was able to replicate uh, that process whereby, uh, in a static field, you could cause uh, levitation, Correct. As I understand it. Mm -hmm. It appears there are a number of ways of doing that. There was another chap called Thomas Townsend Brown Mm -hmm. who who reproduced these sorts of effects working with somebody called um, uh, Beifeld. I can't remember Beifeld's first name. And Beifeld, he knew Einstein. So these were, in their day, these were, you know, very high up scientists. Uh, And some of these people do know that this technology is real. It's just that, for example, if you read Nick Cook's book, The Hunt for Zero Point, Nick Cook is a defense journalist journalist, he sort of points out that a lot of the anti-gravity research seemed to go underground in the in the mid-50s, about 1956. Um, and it, that, that that's a, appears to be when a lot of this technology went into the black world, which of course was uh, not too long after the uh, National Security Council had been set up in 1947 and, and so forth. So the security apparatus of the United States was getting fairly well established and of course everyone was getting pumped up with oil, and the oil companies were starting to get pretty rich by then, and then of course right. that trend has uh, continued since then. Right now, I'm going to I'm going to finalize these thoughts and why it's important for the listener and the layperson. And I, I call you know our people, the majority of us here on this planet of the seven billion people, we're just basic people that are just trying to understand the world around us. Most of us relying upon the information that's given to us, but this static energy field, okay, and the process by which. You know, even on a small scale, you create it, create this static field, okay, and mm-hmm. you you essentially introduce uh, energy into that field and cause we're going to call it molecular dissociation, right? Cause certain things to happen within that static field. Uh, that is potentially uh, what took place, as far as our understanding of it, based on the evidence. Uh, let's say, for instance, we created a you know a, an energy. Uh, field uh, around the World Trade Center and then cause something to happen to where everything just justifies. It's important to understand that process. And that is contained in where the towers go. And a lot of these processes were replicated, duplicated by Mr. Hutchison. That's why his work has been so important. So the bending of steel and how that took place within the static energy field. Well, was he able to to bend a 2.5 inch piece of copper just just right there right in right. front of everyone's eyes it's it's been witnessed he's replicated this process and it could be associated with what happened on 9/11 Right. I mean, you know, that's it. I mean, John's replicated this many, many times, and this is one of these myths that you come across. Oh, he can't replicate it. Well, if he can't replicate it, how come he's got 500 pounds of metal samples then? You know, did he just do that in one go? I mean, th- these are the sort of uh, lies that get promulgated, and then people just repeat them. So that's how the psychological operation right. works. Right. But underlying that, yes, you know, the, the description that you gave there is, 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 is it's, it's my knowledge, you're pretty accurate. And if you uh, introduce uh, 
and mix together certain forms of energy, mm -hmm. such as radio frequency energy, which John was using, microwave energy, mm -hmm. uh, and as you say, a static field from something like a Van de Graaff generator mm -hmm. or a Tesla coil, you can get some very unusual effects coming out, but you have to do it in specific um, ways. And it takes a long time to, um, you know, get this set up. Um, but people like John Hutchinson, uh, John Hutchinson were visited. John Hutchinson was visited by the military industrial complex in 1983, mm -hmm. headed up by Colonel John Alexander. Mm -hmm. And you can go and listen to John Alexander talking about his visit to John Hutchinson. He doesn't make any secret of it, but he claims that what John Hutchinson do was doing was uh, psychokinesis. So we can see clearly that there is a direct line into the military industrial complex mm -hmm. that, that knows about John Hutchinson's research right. and uh, uh, you know and it's 18 years from uh, 1983 to 2001 right. uh, and from our understanding John Alexander already knew Right. already understood what John Hudson was doing when he first went there so they they probably already had the technology at that time okay uh, would be my would be my my guess okay. so it's very important to understand that yes the evidence is all there all you need to do is study it and, and essentially convince yourself you know I'm not out to convince anybody of anything mm -hmm. all I've done is, is is made my experience and knowledge available for people to study for themselves that's right and if they if they want to take a look look at it fantastic and if mm -hmm. they want to write to me and ask me questions to clarify something, mm -hmm. I'll be over the moon and I'll, I'll do my best to answer their questions right. if they're asked in a respectful manner. Ba um, Based on yeah. what you've learned here, and we're, before we go to the break here, I want to ask you this key question. Based on what you've learned about what took place on 9-11, is there evidence that levitation occurred on 9-11? Is there evidence? Oh yeah, very much so, yes. There is evidence, so, very so clearly. Much. So yeah. uh, that's yeah. the first question. Secondly, has that process of levitation been replicated? By Mr. Hutchison. Correct, it has, okay. yes. Okay. And is there a patent that George Piggott has? And it's contained in the book. There is a patent for reproducing in this electrostatic field. Uh, now, most people find this to be unfathomable. And then when they hear from reputable individuals in alternative media, like Alex Jones, who call it space beams, don't you think that's right. a diversion tactic? It is. I mean, Alex Jones as well. I mean, you know, one thing we should discuss here, which we discussed in the break, was that, you know, we understand, I understand that this evidence... We're going to cover this. We're going to cover this right after the break. Stay right there, okay. uh, Andrew. Yep. We have nine seconds. We come back. We are going to talk about what Alex Jones' role has been in keeping your mind away from these very important facts. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm joined by Andrew Johnson, who uh, who has done over the past 10 years uh, to, to not only satisfy his curiosity, uh, but, but, but to address and find and seek the truth. And he has learned how to sift through the truth tellers and the truth distractors. But let me, let me conclude my point here, because the, the listener can... And say to themselves, oh, well, you know, what, why, why is this important, this Hutchins, Hutchison thing? And you're talking about levitation. It sounds like all a bunch of hocus pocus, really. I mean, a lot of people coming new to this and awakening to it need to realize that, that people like, like George uh, Piggott and his, uh, we, we, we can say it, uh, George Piggott and his levitating balls. Um, <laughs> okay. He has a patent for doing such a thing. And also, very important thing that we must understand, and here's the crux of the entire conspiracy, the cover-up, and the reason why it took place. There was a man named Nikola Tesla. And in 1901, he started building something called a Wardenclyffe Tower. And very simply put, this is what I've learned about it through this whole experience right in front of our listening audience. Nikola, Nikola Tesla figured out a way to build a tower, a massive tower. On, we're talking about these concepts on, on a very large scale to where he could take out of the ionosphere energy to be distributed to everyone in the entire world. And we could essentially get free electricity. J.P. Morgan financed that. The banksters financed that. And J.P. Morgan said, I can't put a meter on it and make money off of the backs of the slaves of the population. We are hereby going to stop this project. And he shut down Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla's Research library was burnt down. This man took a beating. And he has basically, Nikola Tesla, had discovered things that are so important, just like John Hutchison, in replicating these things. He's replicated it through his knowledge of Nikola Tesla. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you, as the, as the listeners, need to know that what took place on 9-11, potentially, because of the anomalies that took place, 
the levitation and the spontaneous combustion and the dustification of that building. Now, today, you may be for the first time realizing that the people who have access to that same energy that Nikola Tesla wanted to give to the people of the world, it's been concealed from you. And there's a concerted effort to cover it up, to keep it away. And that power and that energy is being used by evil people who killed 3,000 people on 9-11 and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people since then. Is that a pretty accurate depiction, Andrew Johnson, of what's happening here to the world population, not just to the United States? Oh, yeah. I mean, th this is why it's very important. It's a global thing related to energy. And, and as you say, this story really goes back about 100 years, almost 100 years. Um, and you know, the time with the bankers is, you know, you can see right there that they were beginning to establish their power as, you know, in the energy domain, if you put it like that, around the time that Nikola Tesla was doing this research. And they essentially shut him down. They made him so he couldn't do any real damage. And they were, you know, they took from him the uh, technology that they needed to, uh, you know, basically make a, a, a money machine for themselves, you know, money making machine, which was the electrical current uh, transmission system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Tesla's system was better than uh, Edison's system because it used an alternating current, mm -hmm. whereas Edison's system used direct current. Right. And, was, and uh, uh, Tesla's system was much more efficient. So that that was the you know the regular energy distribution mm -hmm. system. Right. But then Tesla went and worked on this wireless system, which was what the Wardenclyffe Tower was was up all to do with, mm -hmm. and that ended up being blown up. And I just looked up the date, and it was 1917. You know, so yeah, absolutely, yes, it's, it's, it's very fundamental to the way that our our, our world works it's right. uh, the energy question is fundamental to everything once you have free energy you can have as much clean water as you need you can build the t as tall the buildings as you need right. you can have whatever propulsion systems that you need right. and it, we, it will completely transform the nature of our society it will change the whole geopolitical structure of the world that's right uh, and, and and that's why it's so very very dangerous for the status quo it is, it is the single most dangerous thing to the existing status quo right. is the energy issue. Yes, sir. Once it is un known and understood that we can have as much energy as we need right. to whatever to do whatever we need to do it with, then everything changes. Everything, yes, everything sir. changes. In the essence of time, I want to transition from that thought, okay, because uh, there are literally tens of millions of people who have been listening to somebody at the top of the so-called alternative media, which I believe right now has been compromised unless they come out and talk about these issues. But have you ever listened to Alex Jones? Have you listened to him? I have. And okay. we, again, we were talking a bit about yeah. him in the break before. And, the, you know... Here, here's my I, question. I, Hold on one second as, as you answer this. This is the most important question this, that I've been asking myself. Have you ever heard him discuss these most important inventions and the most important evidence that took place on 9-11? Have you ever heard him mention that on the air? Well, I, I think he's probably mentioned energy. He's probably... I know he's talked about peak oil, for example, being a scam, which I agree with. Mm -hmm. um, I agree that peak oil is a scam, but he, he has not connected the energy issue to 9-11, and I believe the reason why he has not done that is because not many people have heard of Nikola Tesla in, in, in the wider scheme of things, but just about everyone in the world has heard of 9-11. So it's very, very dangerous to connect these ideas of 9-11 and the energy issue together and talk about the evidence which connects them. Now, people might say, well, Alex Jones is just, uh, you know, he just, he just hasn't come across this. But we can clearly see that that's not true because he has, you know, he's already ridiculed this research. He's described it as space beams. He's described Dr. Judy Wood as, or implied that she is Marvin the Martian uh, in a discussion with Stephen E. Jones right. a few years ago. Right. He has bigged up Stephen E. Jones, claiming that uh, you know he's got all these credentials and he works for the government and he's headed up research for Los Alamos National Laboratories, which, of course, is where they develop the atomic bomb. Um, so is it that Alex Jones just hasn't come across this? Is he not smart enough to sort of discuss it? Well, clearly those things are not true. Alex Jones is very smart. He's yeah. a very intelligent, very articulate articulate man. He knows what he's talking about. Right. Uh, he's had every opportunity in the last... Well, this research has been on the table for since 2006. The Hudson Effect research has been on the table since 2008. So we're coming up to the five-year mark now. Right. Um, and Alex Jones still hasn't given it a proper 
discussion with his 30 million listeners or however many it is. So whatever he's doing, whether he is a willing participant or an unwitting participant, he is yes, now part of the cover-up, right. the most important cover-up uh, in the world. And Alex Jones is now a part of that. I don't, I, you know, I don't care whether he's a Jesuit or a Zionist or a, whatever it is, he has covered up the study of this research and this evidence which proves the connection between 9-11 and energy That's and right. it is the most important question before us for the reasons that I've already stated. Credentialism and holding nuclear scientists or scientific researchers and all those people that establish credibility uh, to come out and propagate the falsities on behalf of the oil industry. I think that's where the big money comes from, of course. Uh, but we can hold that same level of accountability to somebody like Alex Jones in alternative media, that he is credentialed by his experience, by his knowledge. He's very, very smart, okay? And we can hold him accountable, that if he does not know this and he does not share this with people, he can therefore, in my eyes, as a layperson, be considered suspect. Why would he be wanting to hold this? Because I hold him accountable to all of his knowledge, all of his experience, and him calling himself, he's a self-proclaimed 9-11 truther. And for him not to disclose this factual scientific information would cause us all to consider him to be suspect, correct? Uh, well, I certainly do. Yes. You know, I mean, I, I've made mistakes in the past in my own research. I used to believe the thermite story. I used to believe the official story of 9-11, and I've said that many times yes. in the presentations that I've given. But I've now realized that I was wrong, and I'm, you know, I, I freely admit that. I don't, I don't right. have a problem admitting that I originally what I found out and what I thought was wrong. Right. You know, uh, and I've never heard Alex Jones say anything like that. I've never ex heard him express that kind of humility, right. uh, which is actually one of the important factors. You know, and we've touched on that it's essentially already in our in our uh, discussion. So it, it, that, that's another factor. You know, if you, if you find out that you're wrong, don't mm -hmm. be afraid to admit it. You know, that's right. Um, and, and 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 there are many psychological triggers which uh, we are encouraged not to do that. Politicians, for example, will never admit that they were wrong. Scientists will rarely admit that they were wrong when they discuss cover something. They'll always try and say, well, actually, you know, they'll make excuses. Well, don't bother. Don't waste the time. Just say, look, I was wrong. This is why I thought what I thought. And now I, you know, I know that that was wrong. And this is why I now know that this right. is true. In the remaining yeah. moments here, we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, Andrew's uh, book can be downloaded, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash 911. FTB. And you will also find that copy. I will have it on our website from now and until 7 billion people know about it. Okay? Hmm. I will have it on my website. Now, right. uh, of course, uh, I want you to take these remaining moments uh, and uh, and share your, your final thoughts with our listening audience. And Andrew Johnson, this has been a great, great conversation as a follow-up to Dr. Judy Wood's uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I suppose there's one thing I should add, really, to the discussion. Uh, one of the things that is often, and I think even your caller mentioned it, Dr. Judy Wood's theory. Dr. Judy Wood doesn't have a theory. What she does have is a set of evidence. And I'd like to point out that if you wanted to uh, prosecute somebody in a court, you couldn't do it using a theory. You have to take evidence to the court. And that's exactly what Dr. Judy Wood did with the help of attorney Jerry Leapart in uh, 2007. And she laid the foundation uh, for the legal case using the request for correction to NIST uh, in 2007. And then she built that, uh, the follow-up to that into um, this court case, a key time case uh, for science fraud against 23 of the contractors that NIST used to write the technical reports. And you can read about that on her website. Awesome. Andrew Johnson, thank you. Here are my final words to anyone out there. And I've called out Mr. Gordon Duff. I know that you have the heart, mind, and soul to come forward and say, maybe I haven't looked at it right. And you, I want you to come on the Pete Santilli Show and, and, and admit that in front of the public. That way you can join all 7 billion of us. Alex Jones, it's time for you to come forward and reveal the truth about what you may have been either intentionally or unintentionally concealing from the entire world. I encourage you to come forward. That would be the only instance where you could come on the Pete Santilli Show. I have an open invitation to you, but only to discuss those issues. Good day, everybody, and stay awake. December 21st, the, the day of awakening. 
Let's do this right. Good day. I'm going to ask him if he wants to to take some some questions and feel some questions from okay. the uh, from the chat room. And Andrew Johnson. Yep, sir. Uh, with with your permission, I don't know what your schedule looks like, uh, but would you be willing to stay with us for a few moments to answer sure. some questions from our from our chat room? Moments, moments, yeah. Okay, awesome. And um, uh, Susanna Cole, awesome, awesome show. Oh, it was fantastic. Awesome show. Uh, Andrew, you. seriously, thank you so much, I, Andrew Johnson. Oh, you're, yeah. you're very welcome. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, this is um, this has been. I I can't tell you how many people. Uh, have have come to me, sent me personal notes. Susanna Cole, you see some of the messages that come through to uh, uh, Pete at the Pete Santilli Show dot com. Uh, people who are literally waking up right in front of us. It's the first time they're touched by this information. Andrew, I'm sure you get tremendous gratification from this over the past several years. Uh, watching people yeah. awaken yeah i mean it's you know certainly um in the last sort of six months you know i get i don't get you know like hundreds of emails or anything i've had probably four or five really quite interested emails and with some quite heartfelt uh, you know sort of emotions in there one guy wrote to me and uh, it's very interesting actually because he actually went down to ground zero i think uh on on 9 11 or the day after and they they smuggled themselves into the site with uh, the, one of their brothers had a police, you know, he was a policeman or something, and they got in with his card or something. I, I can't remember his badge or something. And they were walking around the place, you know, and and then he'd he'd only found Doctor Wood's book within the last two or three months. And in fact, what happened was, I know what happened. I remember the story. Hurricane Sandy had gone past. He was in Connecticut, and his power had gone out. And the only thing he had was his Kindle, and he downloaded 9/11 Finding the Truth onto his Kindle, and he started to read it. And and um and then he and then he logged on and he got uh, Dr. Wood's book when his power came back on and he wrote to me and he said uh, he told me about all this story about him going to Ground Zero and he never really thought anything of it you know he thought it was a bit weird but he didn't understand it and then uh, he said uh, at the end of this message which was you know uh, fairly long and he said uh, I, I don't know whether to, to uh, thank you or to to, um, uh, to hate you or something mm, yeah <laughs> you know because right. it had been such a big he, it was just such a rough ride for him, you know, but he, right. I think he was glad that he finally was able to make sense of things. But he, he it was very uncomfortable, obviously, what uh, what he was having to come to terms with. Yep, I have so, a question here, uh, uh, and uh, this comes from. We have a couple questions here. You know, I am Aquarius, but I'm under the impression something will come out of that will change people's thinking. Okay, there's a comment about I think December 21st. Uh, Andrew, is there? A community anywhere that is fully informed on free energy and is taking steps towards utilizing the technology to benefit all. Um, well, um, that's a difficult question to answer. I mean, I'm not an expert on all those various communities. I've heard that there is a community, I think, in uh, Sweden or Switzerland, a small village or town, that actually has spirited away a free energy generator which on which they run their village, and they keep it very secret. And a few people have apparently seen this, but um, uh, it's it, you know it's, it's almost become myth mythological now because I mean I don't know exactly where this is, and I heard of this story a few years ago. Um, what I found is I've, I've put together a, a presentation called Infinite Energy, but not for the masses, and that's on my website. Uh, and, and, and I think I mentioned in the conversation we had a couple of days ago, Pete, that um, this character, Stephen Greer, who set up this free energy group called Seize Power in 2000. Yes, this is important, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then he he basically you know that didn't go anywhere. And then mm -hmm. he kind of said, "Oh, I'm going to start a free energy group in 2007 called Aero 2012." And it was as if the first one never existed because he never even mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, and and there were a number of groups like that around. And I've it, there's if you go on to BrewsterPalmer.com and you download um, uh, the Bruce Department, there's a PDF file about. Is Bruce it Bruce? Palmer's can you can you spell that? It's Bruce. And I'll type, I'll type it for you. Okay. Uh, in the thing. Okay. You can paste it in the chat window. In fact, if I Perfect. put it in there. Uh, that's both of you, isn't it? Okay, so, awesome. Bruce uh, De Palmer okay. uh, uh, dot com, I think. Oh, Excellent. I can't type. Um, if you go to that website, let's just see if that, I've got that right. I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah, there's some PDFs that you can download there, and there's some from a chap called Adam Trombley, who invented a. Uh, 
uh, a device called a Homo Polar Generator, or it was based on a, uh, a cl- it was actually a closed path Homo Polar Generator. You can find details on there somewhere, I think. And Adam Trombley. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see if it's. I didn't receive there. that. I didn't receive that message, by the way. It's Bruce D. Palma, D. E. P. A. L. I've put it in the shared. Oh, in fact, it's got. Oh, into, you did. Uh, okay. the, yeah, it's in the, in the chat room. room. Okay, the fantastic. Room. Awesome. I'll put it in yours as well. Okay. Excellent. Um, and uh, yeah, what what Adam Trombley sort of alludes to is that most of the free energy movement is as controlled and infiltrated as just in the same way that we've been talking about about nine eleven. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's trolls around every corner. Uh, and, and what I've documented is that the, the, the problem with the free energy scene is that the, there are a number of free energy devices around that work, and people have used them and you know, used them to produce small amounts of free energy up to a few kilowatts in size. Um, but when they try and put them into commercial production, that's when the problems start mm-hmm. because you know you, you can get small investors interested and they'll bring in maybe a million dollars or something to get the first production run financed or whatever but then the, 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 they'll come up against health and safety regulations then they'll come up against other regulations and questions start being asked mm-hmm. and of course when the questions start being asked those questions and those answers get fed back up and up the chain mm-hmm. into these secret networks right. and that's when the influence starts coming back down the chain and things get shut down down again right um, I mean you can you can go and look at you know one of the examples I looked at was this fairly recent one uh, let's see for lutech.com.au uh, uh, by the way I have a follow-up question to uh, to to that, that that availability of the free energy stuff when when you're ready to take my question I believe it's yeah. an important one um, are, are, are you uh, personally afraid of the power of big oil that's who we're going up against are you afraid uh, of that? I'm, no, I'm not personally at the moment afraid of the power of big oil. Personally, me, Andrew Johnson, because I'm no threat to them. I'm a nobody with a website that gets 700 hits on a good day, uh, which is nothing. They, they don't need to worry about somebody like me. Um, I'm just irrelevant, and they can pass me off as just some, you know. I, I can promise you that's going to change overnight, but go ahead. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I've mean, i I've never been threatened up to now. No, no, I mean uh, your website traffic, I mean, I, I mean not oh, the threats. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> well, maybe I'll get a few more. Uh, maybe no. I'll get a, get, a, get a few more hits. No, you'll get more than 700 hits, I promise you. Right, okay, <laughs> fair enough. I mean, I've, I've had spikes, you know, into the couple, couple of thousands or whatever. Right. But I do, I do know that these people come and look at the website. I know that Science Application International, they've been poking around on there in the past. ARA, I, I think, have been on there. Um, Sandia Labs, which is one of the Black Ops labs, they've been poking around. In fact, all those sorts of places have come to poke around my website in the past. So I, they know, you know, they know what I've got on there. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't care, you know, because, because, we just don't have the we don't have the exposure. Um, well, here's here's you know. my second my, my well, question. Can I two- say something oh, here? Go ahead. Can mm-hmm. I say something real quick yes. um, before this gets away from us? We have um, someone in the chat that wanted you to know his, um, their name is Pono, and mm-hmm. they wanted you to know they they don't have a question, but would like to thank you for all your work. Well, thank you very much. Well, if you could thank them back, that's that's uh, much that's appreciated. Great. Thank you. Yep, and you hold, just did. Hold on, just one second. I need to stop and restart. Comes where you you're faced with a pitch, which you know ninety five percent of it makes sense, and then there's this remaining five percent, which which is it seems to be very important, but it that also doesn't make sense. And um, so you then go into that five percent and try and explore it, and it's like you know you're talking about these 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 trolls, and these trolls come in different flavors. There are there are people uh, that are out and out debunkers and will just, you know, attack you and uh, insult you before actually making any kind of argument. And then there are those trolls who will befriend you, they will buddy up to you, they will say nice things about you, and then they'll take you 95% of the way with your discussion. And then that remaining 5%, when you start to discuss that, mm-hmm. they will attack you. And uh, you know, say that you're an idiot, which is essentially what what happened to me in my involvement with these one of the uh, 9/11 research groups, which formed in 2005, 2006. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so that so that was my experience, and it all seemed perfectly fine, and everyone seemed to be you know willing to look at the evidence. But then, when this particular evidence, which came up for discussion, which you know is perfectly consistent, perfectly. Uh, uh, 
uh, well documented uh, but they didn't want to discuss that evidence they didn't want to talk about it and when you tried to talk about it they just skipped over it or if you really hammered home the point they'd change the subject or after the it was important for me not to muddle up the terminology because ladies and gentlemen since 9-11 since that horrifying event, and this happens with a lot of things that have that have occurred here in the world, we have been under a psyop. We've been conditioned and trained to hear certain words and think certain things to take us away from uh, the real truth and the real facts and the real evidence. So Andrew actually introduced me to that term muddled, and I, in reading his comment uh, threads, very, very responsibly said, look, at you, you have to look at the evidence very, very clearly and obviously communicate that, but very, be very cautious not to step over the line of assisting the PSYOP. So you have to be very, very cautious as to how you speak of these things, and you also need to be very cognizant of the fact that you're conversing with people, in some cases, who are employed to be there to oppose everything that you're saying about 9-11 uh, evidence, such as what Dr. Judy Wood has revealed, is that the possibility uh, that directed energy weapons were used on 9-11. And we shall be opposed by that, especially if free energy that is available for the entire world uh, could potentially put an oil industry out of business. They have a lot of spare cash to spend in opposing what we're about to talk about here today. So, Andrew Johnson, two months ago, I think it was approximately, that uh, that we had uh, we had met in that in that common thread, and since then I've learned so much about two things: Dr. Judy Wood's uh, evidence, as well as how to how to counter the psyop and deal with the so-called trolls that are out there on the internet. It's a very very interesting phenomena. And welcome to the Pete Santilli Show. Oh, thanks, Pete. Thanks for inviting me on, and uh, and obviously thank you very much for featuring, uh, you know, all the research so heavily in your recent uh, series of programs and so on. It's uh, very important, as you know, that uh, more people become aware and are given a chance to think about things, you know, with a clear view, mm -hmm. as you were saying there in the introduction, rather than having sort of hurdles in the way and things slightly subtly changed. And uh, it's a minefield. It really is. It is, and I, and I sense that just looking at um, at your interest in, in following some of these uh, uh, th these very important topics, I believe I, I believe that you had that same level of curiosity that I've always had about discovering the truth, about learning the truth, and and I think you've approached it in a very sound, sane way, and you've learned a lot through that process, haven't you? Uh, very much so, yes, and I think you've, you've used the key word there, and that is curiosity, and, and if people are not curious, then they really won't, you know, sort of take those first steps into uncovering things, and then following through on that, when you, you know, in other words, if you have a, a basic level of curiosity, you're looking at why, th why there is inconsistency in things, why things, certain things don't seem to make sense, and uh, if you, if you, if you keep your, you know, antennae finely tuned and finely adjusted, you can see you know, the, the difficulty comes out, they'd insult you um, so uh, these things, these were the, some of the things that weren't making sense to me at the time that I first came across uh, what Dr. Judy Wood had started to um, mm -hmm. you know, research and post on the internet for the first time Now, I, I want to I want to really delve into this because you have studied it and I have studied it and I, I think you've seen me uh, i call it getting in there and scrapping with the trolls to really understand and learn how to differentiate uh somebody uh somebody with a negative attitude that opposes a theory uh and then wants to get in there and counter it or here's the next thing that people do not realize is happening and that is what i'm calling it's like a black ops on the internet where we have a secret presence of either government-sponsored or corporate-sponsored individuals that get in there to meld themselves in with society, with Internet society, and, and to mold and shape the threads, the comment threads that you're reading. Because yeah. to the honest observer that gets into a comment thread on any particular topic, if they take a glance at the, at the general topic of conversation, if that message is controlled by...
by these operatives, they've helped sway people away from the true evidence. And they're very, very skilled at this. Is this not a not only a concerted effort, but a grand conspiracy taking place on the Internet right now? Well, I think it's, it's the, I think it's a mixture of things, really, and sometimes it's difficult to categorize the uh, you know certain posters into one or Andrew Johnson uh, from England. Uh, actually, this gentleman has given presentations and written and posted a number of articles on various websites about nine eleven, about Mars, about chemtrails, and anti gravity research. Uh, while challenging some of the authorities uh, to address some of the most compelling data that is available. His website is www.checktheevidence.com, and he recently attended a conference uh, in Europe uh, called the Global Breakthrough Energy Movement uh, back in November and actually attended that conference with Dr. Judy Wood. Now, uh, before I turn it over and introduce uh, Andrew Johnson to you, I want to tell you this is how I had met Andrew Johnson. Uh, I had discovered Dr. Judy's information her, about her book. I actually, I think, uh, shortly before I conversed with him in a comment thread, I had discovered uh, through the, the video uh, uh, that Jesse Ventura, it was a video that I listened to audio, Jesse Ventura talking with Alex Jones about Dr. Judy's information. And uh, Jesse Ventura, since then, uh, obviously has, has done a lot uh, for the world to uh, release Dr. Judy's information. Uh, that he believes is very, very important. Now, Andrew Johnson met me in a comment thread. I had just started learning about her information, and I was immediately starting to talk to people in comment threads. And he brought something to my attention that was so impactful and helped me kind of focus on the task at hand, and that was to learn about all of the evidence. And before I was prepared to start communicating what I had discovered,